2311 Racing could be looking to expand in 2025, and Suras Racing might leave Ford at the end of the 2024 season. What's going on, guys? This is Daniel, and welcome back to our video. We got some NASCAR and other motorsports stories discussed here today on the channel. Let's go ahead and just show them those really quickly. We're going to go ahead and start and talk about Gates Hydraulics. As it was announced on Friday that Gates Hydraulics will sponsor Christian Eckes for five races in 2024. Gates Hydraulics has been a loyal sponsor to Back and Ellie Hilgeman Racing over the course of the last couple of years, for actually a really long time, as a matter of fact. So it's really awesome and really good to see the Gates Hydraulics will continue working with Christian Eckes for the long term for five races this season. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the Toyota Owners 400. Now, it was reported by Joseph Zirigli earlier this evening that the entire field for the Toyota Owners 400 finished within four laps of the leader. That is the closest finish from first to last in NASCAR history in the 76-year history of this sport. That is absolutely incredible. While the racing may not have been really good at the end of the event, one thing that this car has been able to accomplish is making the field get closer together. Again, that doesn't provide the greatest race in the world, but I think it's a pretty great accomplishment, and it shows that the field is getting better overall when it comes to pace as well. So nonetheless, I think it's still a pretty good accomplishment to see the whole entire field finishing within four laps of the leader. I thought there was a good chance we were going to break that record, and sure enough, we did and end up, in fact, breaking that record. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the Dash for Cash. As this upcoming weekend, Mars will be the first of four races for the Dash for Cash for the NASCAR Xfinity Series. The four drivers that have qualified for the first race are Chandler Smith, who won the race at Richmond, Eric Amrol, who finished second, Jesse Love, who finished, I think, fourth, and then Parker Klerkman, who finished seventh. Those are going to be the four drivers that are going to be running for the Dash for Cash this weekend on Saturday afternoon and evening at Martinsville. I look at the four drivers. I think Chandler Smith and Eric Amaral are more than likely going to be the two guys going to win that round. And I think they'll qualify for the next round as well. The winner of the race will score $100,000. If I had to pick the first winner, I think it'll either be Eric Amaral or Chandler Smith. Because those two look to be the strongest currently at the moment going into this race. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about NBM Motorsports. As it was announced on Friday, the NBM Motorsports has confirmed that they are going to run the Cup Series race in Marza with the number 66 team once again. Now, they have not announced which driver is going to be behind the wheel of the number 66 car. My best guess is it's going to be Timmy Hill. He's going to be running, I believe, at North Wilkesboro a few weeks after that, if I'm not mistaken. So I would imagine that Timmy Hill more than likely could be the driver. Maybe they get someone like a Haley Deegan, perhaps, get a start with this team maybe they choose David Starr maybe they get Sage Karam who knows at this point but nonetheless I think it's really cool to see the NBM is back in the NASCAR Cup Series at Martinsville this weekend and hopefully they can form really really well because I certainly do believe that the 66 team could do good they did end up finishing I think nearly near the top 35 or 36 so we'll see if the NBM can have a good performance but I don't know if they're going to contend for the victory but they might be able to have a decent performance this weekend at Martinsville. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Bubba Pollard. Now, Bubba Pollard made his NASCAR Xfinity Series debut this past weekend at Richmond, and he had a very impressive performance. He started last in the race, but he improved as the day goes, went on, and he ended up finishing sixth in his NASCAR Xfinity Series debut at Richmond. Now, he did play a little strategy near the end of the race, and that definitely did help for sure. But to finish sixth in your NASCAR Xfinity Series debut, especially with Junior Motorsports, and that, by the way, according to reports, I think Trey Ryan reported on this as well, that that is the highest finishing run for a Junior Motorsports driver so far in 2024, considering Junior Motorsports has struggled a lot of this year. I was really impressed with his performance. I hope he gets a chance and opportunity to drive with them once again because I think he deserves another start. start. Maybe he gets another opportunity in Mars, although Carson Quaffle is going to be in that 88 car this weekend, so that's probably not going to happen. Still, I was very impressed with Bob Pollard's performance. I think he did a really good job yesterday. I, I think he does deserve another chance and opportunity. I really hope he does get that chance and opportunity because I think he did a really soft and really good job with the team yesterday at Richmond International Raceway. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Chris Wright. As it was announced on Friday that Chris Wright will drive the one truck for Tricon Garage at Texas in Pocono later this season. 
Chris Wright is driving course full-time in ARCA currently this year for Venturini Motorsports, I think in the 15 car, and he's driven in the Xfinity Series and the Truck Series in the past. I'm going to be honest with you guys. I really don't understand why he's getting this chance and opportunity. Chris Wright has always done not really good, even in really good equipment, and has crashed a lot of cars and trucks that he has been in. Realistically, I don't think Chris Wright's going to do much in both these races. He might prove me wrong and do good, but realistically, I just don't see him doing really good this weekend with Tri or next couple of weeks at Tricon Garage. I think he's going to struggle quite a bit. I don't think he's going to perform really, really good, and I don't expect much from him. It's a good opportunity for him, don't get me wrong. It's probably the best opportunity he's gotten so far in his truck series career. But sadly, I don't expect him to make the most of it. I think he definitely will struggle with Tricon Garage next week at Texas. I don't expect him to do much. I think he definitely is going to struggle for sure, in my honest opinion. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the Wood Brothers. Now, Time Card 100 on Twitter put out a very interesting tweet, and I think he had help from Trey Wine working on this as well. But according to him, this is the first day of now the worst average finish of anybody in the field with the 35th place in the owner's points. And right now, they only have one top 25 finish in the first seven races, that being a 11th place finish at Atlanta Motor Speedway. Since then, their best finish, I think, is like 27th or even maybe 26th. They have struggled so far in 2024, and I think their average finish is horrendous, and they're the lowest in unders points they've been since 2008 when they had multiple drivers like maybe Ken Schrader and John Wood and even Marcus Sambros splitting the ride at one point. They have been horrendous. Look, Harris Burton has completely struggled. I'm not going to lie. I don't know if Harris Burt is going to finish this season in that 21 car. He might go through the rest of the year because of sponsorship funding, but if he's going to keep the seat in 2025, have a chance to keep the seat, he really needs to turn the corner very, very quickly because performing the way that he's performed so far this year is not acceptable in my opinion because like I said, going into this year, he was on the hot seat. And so far in 2024, it has not gone well. I don't know who they replaced him with. Maybe Haley Deegan, maybe Riley Herbst, maybe they get Matt Benedetto back, but I don't think Matt Benedetto is going to go back considering he burned bridges with this team. So I don't know if he's going to go back there. But at this point, if you're the Wood Brothers, I know they've got the funding from Dex Imaging, but how much longer is that funding going to make him last? He needs to start showing some improvement, and Harris Burton has been horrendous so far this year. This needs to be talked about. He's on the hot seat right now, and he really needs to turn the corner going forward if he is going to keep this seat long term. In my honest opinion, he really needs to turn the corner. Otherwise, he's going to be released early from this organization and team. And now we're going to hedge up on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Matt Benedetto. Now, I did a video talking about this on the channel yesterday, but Matt Benedetto made his season debut in the Xfinity Series and his first Xfinity Series start since 2019 at Road America. And I was wondering how he was going to perform. Well, in his first start with Viking Motorsports, he finished 18th in the first of five races that he scheduled with this team. He'll be back in the 30A car this week at Martinsville. He ran top 20 pretty much all day long yesterday or a couple days ago when you're watching this video, and he did absolutely an exceptional and a very, very good job. At points, was inside the top 13 and at times had top 10 pace and speed. Now, the car kind of went away from them near the end of the race and the event, but they showed that they've got potential. Now, RSS Racing, to my understanding, they're really, really helping them. There were times where Matt Benedetto was outperforming drivers like Haley Deegan, Shane Van Gisbergen, AJ Allmendinger, even at points, Sheldon Crew to completely struggle. We saw Matt Benedetto do an absolute amazing and really good job for the first start. And if you're looking at this 38 team, especially owner points sake, and you're looking at if he could finish the rest of the year, because like I mentioned, he's only got five races scheduled with this organization at this point. I think he should finish the year with this team. If he's running top 20 in his first start, in his first Xfinity start in nearly five years, I think he's only going to get better. He was the highest finishing RSS racing car. I know that Ryan Seek had issues, but still, I was super impressed with the speed that Matt Benedetto showed at Richmond, and I think he's only going to get better. He's had some solid pace at Martinsville in the past. Hopefully, he'll get the chance and opportunity to finish the year with this organization. I think he did a really good job of Viking Motorsports. Yes, I know they're getting help from Ray RSS, but still, nonetheless, a really good performance to Matt Benedetto in his season debut. I think he did a really solid and good job, to be honest with you. 
And now we're going to head to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Eric Amarola. As Eric Amarola confirmed on Twitter yesterday that he'll be once again back with Joe Gibbs Racing this weekend at Martinsville driving the number 20 car. This will be Eric Amarola's fourth start of the NASCAR Xfinity Series season of 15 scheduled starts for him this year and will be a second straight start in the number 20 car. Eric Ombrell, also like I mentioned, will be competing for the Dash for Cash as well. Now, Eric Ombrell absolutely impressed the hell out of me this past week at Richmond. He had the strongest car for the first two-thirds of the race. It seemed like his car did fade a little bit near the end of the race at Richmond, but he still was up front and ran top five pretty much all day long. And when I look at Martinsville, the last time he ran there, at least in the cup side with that 10 car, he only had about 20 laps. If he would have basically held on for 20 laps... He would have won that race. I think especially the 20 car, you go back to last year, this 20 car won the spring race with John Hunter Nemechek. I think that Eric Amrola is going to have a really strong opportunity and a great chance to get it done. I think the 20 team's got the pace to contend for the victory, and certainly I think he will be a major threat and a serious contender to get it done this week in Amarzal. Joe Gibbs Racing historically has been amazing. They've been great at this racetrack, and nonetheless, I do expect that we are going to see this team perform really, really good. He's done a great job, and right now looking at the standings in the first six, four, five, or six race of the year, he has finished inside the top 10 a couple times, and is 19th in the points, despite not running the whole entire season. He's been really good so far this year. I've been really impressed, and I think he's got a really good chance and opportunity to win this week in Amarnsville. I expect him to be a threat. I think he'll have good pace and speed, and I think he definitely will be contender for the victory this weekend. Excited to see what he can do this weekend at Martinsville. And now we're going to head to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Martin Truex Jr. Now, if you watch the NASCAR Cup Series race, at Richmond earlier this evening on Easter, you saw the Martrix Jr. after the race and at the end of the race was not very happy. And I think it's definitely very understandable. Martrix Jr. was easily cruising his way to victory lane and was leaning by about a second over Joey Logano and Denny Hamlin with around two laps to go. Unfortunately, with two laps to go, Kyle Larson got loose off the corner going into turn number four and Bubba Walls got into Kyle Larson. Then they had a pit stop, and Martrix Jr. had a slow pit stop, and Denny Hamlin had a better pit stop, and Denny Hamlin won the race off pit road. Then we get to the restart, and now there's video evidence clearly showing that Denny Hamlin did, in fact, slightly jump the restart, clearly jump the restart over Martrix Jr. Now, Martrix Jr. was very pissed off, not just at Denny Hamlin, but also at Kyle Larson as well. He expressed his frustration on the last lap, drove Kyle Larson way down the racetrack, put Larson in the wall, then Kyle Larson retaliated, got into Martrex Jr., and then Truex, I think, tried to fence Kyle Larson after the race. Then, after that, Martrex Jr. went up and ran into the back of Denny Hamlin after the race, showing his displeasure. Denny spoke to the media after the race, and he was still very pissed off and frustrated with the outcome. I completely understand Martrex Jr.'s frustration. This is not the first time that Martrex Jr. was on the way to easily cruising to a victory, and something bad goes wrong for him. He was in a great position to get it done. He had the car to beat tonight, led over 200 laps. I feel terrible for Martrex Jr. I know the picker could have done a better job. I know Martin probably shouldn't have shown his emotions. It's unclear how long he's going to still be in the Cup Series at this point. But still, man, I feel terrible for Martin. He has been so close to winning races. He's had speed all year. But I do think at the same token, same time, if you are a Martrex Jr. fan, as much as it does suck, because I am a Martrex Jr. fan myself, as much as it does suck to see the way this race sadly ended for him, I certainly do believe that Martrex Jr. is going to have a chance to win more races this year, and I certainly believe he's going to get better as the year progresses and goes on. But like I said, I get the frustration. I get the understate. I really understand why he's upset. I get why he was pissed. He has every right to be frustrated about it because he definitely had the car to beat tonight and lost the race because of traffic and also lost the race because of pit crew and just unfortunate timing with the cosh coming out with two laps to go. If it happens on the white flag, he wins the race easily, and we're not even having a conversation about this. Nonetheless, it sucks for Martin Tricks Jr. I think he doesn't need to go after Denny Hamlin, except maybe for the restart stuff, but I didn't see why, why he was pissed off at Kyle Larson. I didn't really get that. But nonetheless, I do understand Mark Trish and his frustration because he was in position to win and sadly lost his chance and opportunity to go ahead and win the race. 
And now we're going to hedge up on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Josh Berry and Daniel Suarez. Now, if you watched Cup Series race in Richmond, you saw what happened near the end of stage number one. Josh Berry clearly had one of the fastest cars going through the field. But with seven laps to go in stage number one, Josh Berry completely sends it into turn number one. Daniel Suarez comes down a little bit, and Daniel Suarez ends up spinning out off a of contact from Josh Berry, dropping Daniel Suarez all the way back to last. Daniel Suarez expressed frustration on the radio, was not very happy with Josh Berry after the incident, and Josh Berry also felt a little frustrated as well. Then in stage number two, near the end of it, Daniel Suarez was doing everything he could to hold up Josh Berry. He never really wrecked him, but he definitely for sure got in the back of Josh Berry, forced him up the racetrack. I was watching the gaps on Fox. They never really mentioned this on the broadcast, by the way. It was showing his retaliation and his frustration with Josh Berry. And then after the race, Taylor Kitchen from TobyChristie.com caught the fight that was basically going on and taking place, or the confrontation that was going on. You saw that he was not, that Daniel Suarez was not happy with Josh Berry. It didn't really seem like that Josh Berry cared, to be honest, about the situation, but Daniel Suarez was not very happy. Look, when I look at the incident of what happened between Josh Berry and Daniel Suarez, I put more blame on Daniel Suarez a little bit there or put a little blame on Josh Berry. I don't think one driver was at fault more than the other, to be honest, because I clearly do believe that both were at fault in some instance. I think that Daniel Suarez had every right to be frustrated because he was actually having a really good run. He's been hit or miss at this racetrack. He's had some great runs, especially during the Joe Gibbs racing area when he drove there, but he's also had some not-so-good runs at this racetrack, and I think he was hoping for a really, really good run and sadly did not get the run that he probably deserved because he finished multiple laps down and finished around 30th position in 30th place in the race. I do get Daniel Suarez's frustration. I also understand that Josh Berry was a clearly faster car because Josh Berry was having his best performance of the scene so far. He was at one point at the second place, and there were times where Josh Berry was clearly faster in this race than even Martin Trick Jr. at times. It's just the pit crew cost Josh Berry a shot at winning, but he did end up getting a top 15, but I think he was definitely hoping for a little bit more of a better race. Nonetheless, it's interesting to see if both drivers had tension. I wonder if things are going to carry over, considering we are headed to Martinsville next week. I do believe that that could carry, and we'll see if it does, in fact, end up carrying over to the race this weekend at Martinsville. It might end up, but we'll have to wait and see what happens. And now we're going to hedge up on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the officiating from NASCAR. Now, one of the biggest headlines coming out of the NASCAR Cup Series race from Richmond was the terrible officiating all night long. Goodness gracious, the officiating for the NASCAR Cup Series race was very unacceptable. There were a lot of bad calls. Now, NASCAR and the media members were speaking to Elton Sawyer about what happened in the officiating. They spoke on the wet weather tires and the calls around that and decisions they made. They talked about the call on lap 170 for the caution there, and then they made the calls for Denny Hamlin jumping the final restart. Let's first get to the Denny Hamlin final restart call. They said they reviewed the incident. They originally said they never reviewed the incident, and then they actually reviewed the incident, and they said that it all was good. Well, as I mentioned earlier with Mark Truck Jr.'s frustration, you can actually clearly see in a video that surfaced from NTJ Hub on Twitter that Denny Hamlin did, in fact, jump the race start a little bit. It wasn't insane by any stretch of imagination, but you can clearly tell that Denny Hamlin jumped the race start. I feel like that that definitely was a missed call on NASCAR's end. That's my opinion. They absolutely missed it on that part, and that's on NASCAR to correct that. Because in my personal opinion, I think he clearly jumped the restart. Now, obviously, I think a reason they didn't is because they didn't want to basically force a disqualification considering the sponsor of the event, that being Toyota Owners. But I think Denny Hamill did at least jump the restart just a little bit considering from the angle that we ended up happening. Then we get to the Kyle Busch call. The caution for Kyle Busch was terrible. That was one of the worst calls I've seen for a caution. That was like the Derek Cope caution in 2017 when they threw the final yellow. I personally think that that was not a caution. It may have been caution-worthy in other instances, but it screwed up the strategy, and I think it really screwed up this race. Because once that caution came out, it ruined the strategy. And I think NASCAR was way too trigger-happy on the button there. Then the officiating for the non-competitive pit stops. If I'm not mistaken, they're not supposed to be counting laps during a non-competitive pit stop. So why in the hell were they were they counting caution laps during non-competitive pit stops? That made no sense to me. And I just never understood 
why they were calling that. I personally think they made a terrible call on that front in that aspect, and I certainly think that some of the officiating was unacceptable. And it ruined, in my opinion, what was looking to be a good race. I think they did a good job doing the wet weather tires, but they wasted so much time under caution, they should have just red flagged it at that point and not counted laps under caution. There was a lot of bad officiating all night long, and certainly I think there were some horrendous and bad calls all night long, and I think officiating needs to get better. They've had some egregious times this year with the caution and trigger happy. Of course, we did get the first overtime finish. I think NASCAR times tonight was too egregious with the button. They were doing a bad job in that front, in that aspect, to be honest with you. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Bubba Wallace and Kyle Larson. Now, these two drivers have a little bit of history going all the way back to 2022 at Las Vegas Motor Speedway where Bubba Wallace did retaliate against Kyle Larson after Kyle Larson forced Bubba Wallace into the wall. That unfortunately resulted in Bubba Wallace receiving a suspension. And tonight, it looked like that that was going to resurface once again. With two laps to go in the race, there was contact between Bubba Wallace and Kyle Larson. Kyle Larson gets loose coming off the corner, and Bubba Wallace really had nowhere to go, and sadly, Kyle Larson spun. Now, luckily for Kyle Larson, he only lost two positions and was able to basically maintain fourth position after the pit stops and up getting a third-place finish. Meanwhile, Bubba Wallace had a terrible pit stop for some of the damage it seemed like and ended up finishing in 13th in the race. Now, after the race, Kyle Larson spoke to the media, said there really wasn't any will ill will heal feelings toward Bubba Walls, and Bubba Walls actually came up to Kyle Larson and apologized to him for the incident on the racetrack. But Kyle Larson was not mad for the wreck that ended up taking place. He seemed fine with it, and he said, I still got a good finish anyways. I didn't lose a lot of positions, and it seems like all good between both of them. Like I said, these two have a little bit of history, but it, to me... I don't think any drivers at fault. Well, I think both are at fault. In some instance, Kyle Larson got loose. I think Bubba could have backed off just a little bit there. But you're going for a position, and you're going to try to do the best you can to go out there and win the race and get a good finish. Because Bubba Walls is having his best run of the year so far up to that point. And Kyle Larson had had a dominant car early in the race. They were running for a top five position. I do think that it cost Kyle Larson maybe a chance at winning. But at the end of the day, it is what it is. At least Bubba Walls was man enough to go up there and apologize to Kyle Larson. Because sometimes we've seen drivers have shrugged off these situations and they won't go up to a driver and apologize for the wreck. They'll confront him. But Kyle Larson, like I said, is someone that normally does not get mad. In fact, when you look at how what happened with Mark Trek Jr., Kyle Larson was not even mad at Mark Trek Jr. for running in him. Yes, he showed it and expressed his displeasure by running into Trex. But Larson was like, I don't know why Trex is mad at me. I know he's mad at Denny. I hope that Trex wasn't really mad at me for the antics. I don't really have any disrespect toward him. It seems like the Bubba and Kyle Larson do, do have respect for each other and they do race each other hard but a lot of times they race each other very fair and these guys have been friends for a very very long time so to me as much as I think a lot of people are going to try to make a headline a storyline out of this like I probably did at the same token, same time I think it's really cool to see that Bubba did go up and conf not confront but talk to Kyle Larson and apologize him for the incident I think that's something that's really good to see and I think that we're not going to see any issues between both drivers that's something really good to see for sure Nonetheless, glad to see that nothing really came out from the situation, considering that things could have definitely gotten pretty ugly for sure if things would have happened on pit road. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Joey Gase versus Dawson Cram. Now, if you watched the NASCAR Xfinity Series race yesterday, you saw what happened between Joey Gase and Dawson Cram. With about 80 laps to go in the NASCAR Xfinity Series race at Richmond International Raceway, Joey Gase and Dawson Cram were battling for around 30th to 32nd position in the race, and Dawson Cram just sent Joey Gase really hard into the outside wall, completely destroying the rear back bumper of Joey Gase's car. There was a lot of communication on the radio. Dawson Cram's pit crew and his team were not very happy with Dawson for what he did on the racetrack. Well, Joey Gase was also not very happy about the situation. Because during nonstop on the race, basically during the broadcast, we saw Joey Gase get really upset and mad. He took the rear bumper cover off of his car, and I think he tried to throw it through the passenger window on the car. But instead, it landed on the roof of his car, basically damaging the front of it just a little bit. After that, we saw Joey Gase walk down across the racetrack, like I said, and got into the ambulance and went to the infield care center. 
After that happened, he was interviewed by Fox Sports and many reporters in the industry that Johnson Cram needs to use his head and basically said that JD Motorsports is in the business for crashing cars while Joey Gase's organization is not in the business for that. And then they actually spoke after the race about the situation. Dawson Cram really had no comment on the situation. And of course, Joey Gay spoke to the media more about it. Now, I saw something earlier tonight where they're planning to think, donate that sheet metal to charity, if I'm not mistaken. And they're planning to do that. I know Joey Gay said, hope you enjoyed your souvenir, Dawson. And then Dawson, like I said, is planning to go ahead and donate that to charity. When I look in the situation, I think that Joey Gay has every right to express his frustration for the situation, especially since he got completely dumped going in the corner. I don't blame him for being upset about what happened. And I don't think he really should get a penalty for that. But I do think there might be penalties that are coming for Joey Gase. And here's what I think it's going to be. I don't think, personally, he is going to get suspended, but I think he is going to get a fine. NASCAR clearly frowns upon walking across an active racetrack. We've seen Drivers can get seriously hurt, especially with these cars moving. I know they're probably moving at a much slower speed, but still getting about a car at 45 to 50 miles an hour definitely is going to hurt you. So I think that NASCAR is going to find Joey Gase later this week. Do I think there's going to be any more penalty other than that? No, I don't think they're going to suspend him personally. I don't think they're going to do what they did to Josh Williams. I don't think that Joey Gase is going to get suspended. And like I said, Going back to the situation, we need people and we need personalities in the sport. And I think Joey Gase gained a ton of fans. Joey's been around the sport for a very, very long time. From what I understand, they were maybe looking to run two cars this week. And they had two cars ready to go for Marzal. But because of the wreck, they're now likely only going to have one car ready to go this week in a Marzal. And I'm not sure who's buying the wheel of that car at this point. We'll have to kind of wait and see when the interest list releases later today. But like I said, I 1,000% get the frustration from Joey Gase. I think it's ever had to be upset with Dawson Cram for that. Dawson should know better. The guy's got talent, but you don't run in the back of somebody, bump him down the straightaway. We're not in a super speedway, dude. We're at a short track. I get Joey Gase's frustration 100%. And then, like I said, I think he's got every right to be upset and mad and frustrated at Dawson Cram for that. But I do believe that there are going to be some penalties coming, not because I don't think they're deserved. I just think NASCAR is going to frown upon him walking across an active racetrack. And now we're going to hedge up on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Chris Bell and Kyle Busch. Now, if you watched the NASCAR Cup Series race last weekend at Circuit Americas, you saw what happened between Chris Bell and Kyle Busch. With around 20 25 laps to go in the NASCAR Cup Series race, Chris Bell had much fresher tires, I believe, than Kyle Busch at the time. He tries to go in the corner. Kyle Busch came down just a little bit, and Chris Bell unintentionally runs into Kyle Busch. Now, earlier in this race, Chris Bell had gotten into the other Kyle, that being Kyle Larson, and Kyle Busch was right there to witness that. And after the incident happened, Kyle Busch, yes, only lost a few positions on the racetrack, but Kyle Busch was clearly not happy with Chris Bell and went and confronted him after the race. There was communication that surfaced saying, have I, have I wrecked you before? And Chris Bell said no, and Kyle Busch said, that's twice that's happened now. And he said, you've got one coming. Now, after this happened, I believe it was on Monday, Chris Bell and Kyle Busch spoke to the media, and they apparently had a conversation on Monday. Chris Bell was a little worried that Kyle Busch was not going to call him back. Chris Bell texted Kyle Busch to call him, and then they did have a conversation. Now, Kyle Busch expressed to the media that he is going to race Chris Bell a lot differently, at least for the short term. He's going to race him harder on the racetrack every single race when he is around him. I get Kyle Busch being a little upset and frustrated, but at least one good thing I will respect about Chris Bell, kind of like when I talk about Bo Wallace, Kyle Larson, I respect Chris Bell for trying to reach out to Kyle Busch because I know Chris Bell has a ton of respect for Kyle Busch, and I think Kyle Busch does have a lot of respect for Chris Bell as well. But at the same token, same time, you got to be careful what you're doing. But going back to the incident of what happened at Cirque in Americas, if you were to ask me who's more blamed for the situation in wreck, I still put a little more blame on Chris Bell for sending it on fresh tires, but also do put a little blame on Kyle Busch in that situation because Kyle Busch could have definitely backed off a little bit there as well and could have waited to go down the corner a little bit. He was arcing those corners, and it seemed like Chris Bell, to be fair, was going into the corner much normal than Kyle Busch was, and I think that's why the contact happened in the first place. Now, those two did not race each other really hard because Kyle Busch was struggling quite a bit 
this past week at Richmond. Well, of course, Christian Bell had a really fast car at Richmond. Just unfortunately got a speeding penalty. And I'm not sure how Kyle Busch is going to form this weekend at Marsville, considering the fact historically Kyle, Kyle Busch is good at Marsville, but he has not been good with the RSR equipment this past year. So we'll see how Kyle Busch ends up doing. But again, I think it's good on Chris Bell to reach out to Kyle Busch, and I think that's what we want to see. We've seen a lot of drivers sending messages this week and clearly sending those messages. Like we talked about with Dawson Cram and Joey Gase. We saw Joey Gase send a clear message to Dawson Cram, expressing his frustration and anger for what happened on the racetrack. You now have got Chris Bell and Kyle Busch who express messages with each other, and now it seems like hopefully they will both be on good terms going forward. But I'm not sure if that is going to be the case. Hopefully things continue to be good between both of them, because like I said, I think Chris Bell has a lot of respect for Kyle Busch, and I don't think he wants to disrespect Kyle Busch. He's someone he probably looks up to. He's someone he loves racing. Kyle Busch has a lot of respect for drivers in the garage. So when Kyle Busch comes up to you, you got to lurk. At least Kyle Busch didn't go up there and bum rush him and try to fight him. He just wanted to have a conversation with them, and he does have respect. You just got to be careful what you do on the racetrack. Nonetheless, the big positive coming out of this situation is the fact that they both had a conversation and they tried to have the conversation early in the week. And now we're going to head jump on to the final major story of today's episode as we're having a combination of two stories, that being 2311 Racing and Stuart Haas Racing. Now, there has been a lot of talk and conversations over the course of the last couple of weeks surrounding who might be expanding and who might be downsizing going into 2025 and also who might be leaving manufacturers as well. Let's first start off with 2311 Racing. Now, Adam Stern reported this in Sports Business Journal early in the week, I think on Thursday, that 2311 Racing could be one of the teams that is looking to expand in 2025. However, according to Adam Stern, they're waiting to see what happens with the charter agreement and once it gets finalized. Currently at the moment, the charter agreement is not finalized for 2025. The teams and the drivers in the industry who are working to try to get the charter agreement done, they've been hoping to have the charter agreement done a lot sooner at this point, and those meetings had stopped in January. NASCAR tried to hold a meeting, well not NASCAR, but the teams themselves and team owners, Denny Hamill's among those, Jeff Gordon, Rick Kendrick, Joe Gibbs, were all among the team owners that were involved in those meetings. And NASCAR, instead of going to all of them to speak to them, they instead went team by team trying to break up what seems like maybe a, some sort of model going on to try to get it done. But obviously, 2311 Racing is one of those organizations that clearly wants to expand in 2025. And I think there is a very strong chance and possibly they're going to do that. But they're going to need a charter to go ahead and expand in the 2025 season. And one of the biggest talking points that's been going on is money. Money has been a massive talking point over the course of the last few years. Last year, Live Fast Motorsports sold their Charter Spire Motorsports for around $40 million. And some are expecting, if the Charter system is still around, some are expecting that Charter money to go up from $40 million to even $50 million. Now, it's no secret that Denny Hamlin and Michael Jordan both have a lot of money. Michael Jordan just sold the Charlotte Hornets to a bunch of investors for, I think, over a billion or even $2 billion. So he sold them for a lot of money. So money is not a major issue. Now, if 2311 Racing is able to acquire Charter and they're able to expand because they want to be a three or four car organization as early as next year, what drivers could they go after? Well, there's a lot of possibilities. Corey Heim. Corey Heim is a reserve driver for 2311 Racing and also Legacy Motor Club and has been extremely impressive in the NASCAR Xfinity Series and the Truck Series as well. Right now in the Truck Series, Corey Heim has a third place average finish and just won the most recent race at Circuit of the Americas. In his second or third start in Xfinity this year, he finished in fourth and even led laps and at times had the fastest car early in the race. And like I mentioned, he's a reserve driver, so he probably would be the first choice. You then have Chandler Smith. Chandler Smith currently competes full-time with Joe Gibbs Racing in the NASCAR Xfinity Series. And right now, Chandler Smith has been doing a fantastic job in Xfinity. He's got two wins so far this year. And I think there's a really strong chance and possibility, whether Denny Hamlin or Mark Trickson retires, there's a very strong chance and possibility that we're going to end up seeing him take over one of those guys' seats in 2025. What about Denny Hamlin himself? Denny Hamlin has stated that he doesn't want to run full-time with this team, but he would like to run there after he finishes his full-time career with Joe Gibbs Racing. That definitely, certainly, could be a possibility for sure. 
You then have other drivers like Sheldon Creed, but Sheldon Creed's been struggling in Xfinity. You do have Kurt Busch. I know Kurt's been kind of teasing a return at some point, but that might not happen at this point. We'll have to wait and see. You've also got, of course, Carl Leverts who come out of retirement. I know he's been spotted with teams. I know he's worked with 2311 Racing to try to grow that team, but I don't know if he's going to end up driving for the organization. you also got Eric Armroll who can make starts with his organization and team. Eric Armroll's been doing a good job in Xfinity with JGR so far. So that certainly could be a possibility and a shout going forward into the future. Nonetheless, I think 2311 Racing is very likely going to expand in 2025. Again, they're going to need a charter. Now, where could 2311 Racing get their charter from? Insert Sewer Haas Racing. According to Couch Tracer last week, there are a couple teams that are looking to expand. But in order for them to go ahead and expand, they're going to need a charter for that move to end up taking place. Now, there's been a lot of chat and rumors over the course of the last few months that Stuart Haas Racing might be leaving Ford at the end of 2024 and might be going to a different manufacturer in 2025. There's also been a lot of chatter that Stuart Haas Racing could sell, if not one, maybe as many as two charters if they do, in fact, stay with Ford or go to another manufacturer in 2025. The reason that Stuart Haas Racing right now has four charters at the moment is because they're required to have four charter cars with the current Ford agreement they have. But here's the problem. Their agreement with Ford expires at the end of this year, and they still do not have a Ford deal done. And it was reported back at Daytona, I know Eric Eastab mentioned this during a press conference when Front Row being announced as a Tier 1 team, it was mentioned that Mark Brushwick said no comment. And we're getting into early March. And we saw some teams make moves early that were making moves to different manufacturers. We know the Legacy Motor Club announced in May that they're be switching from Chevrolet to Toyota. And there's a couple other teams. I think it was announced in June or July of 2016 that, that uh, SHR was going to be switching over from Chevrolet. Ford. Now, Stuart Haas Racing has had a lot of success up to this point with Ford. But it is no secret that Stuart Haas Racing, for the most part, has struggled over the course of the last few years. Now, to be fair and to their credit, they have shown some good pace in speed. And they've had some good pace at times so far this year. Josh Berry had a good performance in Richmond earlier this evening. And a couple other drivers like Noah Grayson and Ryan Priest and even Chase Briscoe at times have been pretty consistent and pretty quick inside the top 15 and 20. But the problem is they're not the same team they used to be. They've lost Kevin Harvick during the soft season. They lost Eric Amarola, who retired from full-time racing, but is racing part-time with JGR. They had an opportunity to pick up Kyle Larson. That obviously never ended up happening because of sponsorship, and Ford did not want him. They had an opportunity, a chance to pick up Kyle Busch. That did not happen, unfortunately, because I don't think Ford really wanted him. There's a lot of rumors that Kyle Busch was going to go there. They could have picked up Zane Smith because Zane Smith is high up on the Ford plant. Zane obviously went over to Trackhouse and Spire. And then, of course, they could have picked up Michael McDowell. They could have gotten Todd Gillen at one point this year. Maybe even Harrison Burns' name has a mention because some of those drivers do bring sponsorship in funding. But unfortunately, they just don't have the outright pace and speed of 10. They've lost a lot of sponsors, which is why there's a lot of rumors that they could be selling a charter. But going back to the rumors, Stuart Haas Racing, it sounds like that they're potentially leaving Ford at the end of this year. Now, I do think that if they do leave Ford at the end of this year and go to a different manufacturer, I think they're going to sound size to a three-car organization or maybe even a two-car organization. But more than likely, I would imagine they would downsize to a three-car organization. Now, if they do, in fact, end up leaving Ford at the end of this year, what manufacturer could they possibly go to? Well, they could go to Chevrolet. They had a lot of success with Chevrolet from 2009 to 2016. Both of their championships that they've won in NASCAR have been won in the Chevy camp in the Cup Series. They won the championship in 2011 with Tony Sir after that extremely historic run. And they also won the championship in 2014 in Kevin Harvick's first season. And they had a pretty big alliance with Hendrick Motorsports. Now, they're probably not going to be a Tier 1 organization if they do switch over to Chevrolet. They're probably likely going to be a Tier 2 team or a Tier 1.5 team. They'd probably be below Hendrick Motorsports and probably be on the same level as Trackhouse or, of course, the other team being Rich Chills Racing, but they might even be lower than that, and they might struggle a bit as well. And then there's also Toyota. Toyota has three Tier 1 organizations, that being 2311 Racing, Bubba Walls, and Tyler Reddick. You, of course, got 
Legacy Motor Club with Eric Jones and John Hunter Nemechek and even Jimmy Johnson, even Corey Heim. And then also you've got Joe Gibbs Racing with Denny Hamlin, Ty Gibbs. You've got, of course, uh, of course Ty Gibbs and, of course, Chris Bell and Mark Trix Jr. as well, all driving for Joe Gibbs Racing. But I don't think they're going to want another Tier 1 team at Toyota. But then you throw a wild card in, and that is Honda. Honda has been rumored over the course of the last few months and years that they might end up switching over to NASCAR. There's been a lot of frustration going inside of IndyCar, and Honda's been heavily rumored that they could be leaving IndyCar at the end of their deal with IndyCar at the end of 2026. Now, they could absolutely go over and focus on on being in F1 because they're going to be working at Aston Martin in a big way. But I also think there's a really strong chance of possibility that they are going to leave and go over to NASCAR as well. Their manufacturing name has been listed a lot. And I think SHR would be a really good organization to start off with, have a new fresh start. Now, obviously, what does it mean for the drivers of the team? It could affect drivers like Chase Briscoe and Ryan Priest at the organization, considering Chase Briscoe has a long-term deal with Ford. And I think that that could happen. Now, what do I think is going to happen at SHR? I think that they are going to downsize next year, potentially. I think they're going to switch manufacturers. I think they're going to switch Chevy for one year and then maybe switch to Honda next year. That is definitely going to be interesting, though, to watch and see what happens. Nonetheless, I do think that that charter that SHR loses will go to 2311 Racing, considering the fact that 2311 Racing won't expand. And we remember talking about this, that 2311 Racing almost went to Ford, and Denny Hamill almost went to Ford as well. It'll be interesting to see what happens and see what the team decides to do in 2024 and see if they stay with Chevy, no Ford, or if they go to Chevy. So that is going to be today's NASCAR news and motorsports news video. I want to thank guys for watching. Please subscribe to the channel. Notifications on so if I win a video, it does go live on my channel. Follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and support on Patreon as well. Let's go to below that and comment your thoughts below on today's video. Do you think 2011 racing is going to expand? Let me your thoughts in the comments below. And what are thoughts about Sewer Haas Racing potentially leaving Ford? Let me your thoughts in the comments below. Tomorrow on the channel, we might have the intro this video dropping for Martinsville, and we're also going to have Truck Series race picks. Wednesday, we'll likely have a news video, and we're also going to have race picks for Xfinity. Thursday, race picks for Cup and the Paint Scheme preview dropping. So anyways, like I said, I want to thank you guys for watching today's episode, and I'll see you guys next time for more great awesome NASCAR content and other motorsports content on the channel like this. Take care, everybody.